So, Charles, you will say a few words, 10 minutes, for the panel. Okay. Followed by Jim, okay. Christine, and finally, Philip. Okay. Well, uh, me too. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor and a great pleasure as well. Uh, now, our, our chairman put uh, to us, uh, I mean, to me, three questions uh, following up on the previous session. Uh, what are the sources of low inflation? What are the implications of persistently low inflation for macroeconomic performance in the euro area? And what are the implications for the uh, monetary transmission mechanism? So I'll try to deal with these questions in my, in my own way. Um, now, I think this morning we had, uh, we had great presentations that uh, build up on a, on a very large literature on why, why we have had such uh, stubbornly low inflation. And, and my reading of, of my understanding of this literature and, 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 and what we heard this morning is that um, there is general agreement that cyclical conditions, so the, the slope of the Phillips curve, matter less and less for inflation, but they matter. Uh, we'll listen uh, later to Christine uh, who uh, is uh, highly up more in evidence that foreign, what's happening abroad, elsewhere in the world, or exogenous things that are not Philip's curve, uh, matter more and more. Uh, and uh, we had uh, Yuri's uh, presentation, which, uh, uh, to put in a very simple way, uh, tell us that people, normal people don't care about monetary policy. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's a shortcut, uh, but that's, that's what I got out of it. And uh, that, 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 is, that is important and, and interesting. Uh, now, I've put here uh, the inflation performance. Uh, you know these curves by heart. It's annual inflation. In blue, it's the euro area. And uh, in red, it's the country where I live, but which is interesting because it, it has had stubbornly low inflation. Actually, Switzerland had had negative inflation for much of the last eight years. And we, we all have been trained to think of deflation, negative inflation, deflation as a total disaster. Uh, and I see Governor Kuroda <laughs> seeing what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the experience of Switzerland is, is exactly like Yuri. People just don't care. Uh, people don't know that inflation is negative. They don't think it's a problem at all. Uh, and they're happy to live with it forever. Uh, and have many children at the same time. So the, 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 this sort of go, goes very much in, 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 this, in this line. Now, what, what I sort of my, my uh, just looking at the data, but there's a lot more uh, formal uh, work, uh, is that inflation was stabilized before the recession, well, the great crisis, uh, ar around the uh, slightly above uh, the target for the ECB uh, and smack in the middle of the, the, of the range for the uh, uh, Swiss National Bank. And then, boom, there was the change of regime. The crisis came, chopped, pushed everything down uh, by a, a big notch. And since then, it's been fluctuating on average uh, significantly below what it was be before. And that's sort of the external shock that comes in and that is very, very powerful. So it does in intuitively the, the interpretations uh, above uh, seem to do a good job in explaining. So the conclusion, and, and, and I'm going to paraphrase what was said earlier, uh, the, uh, I think by uh, Lucrezia, the Phillips curve is alive, uh, but uh, it's not kicking very much. Uh, and um, that, 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 I think, is, is what we are witnessing. So the theory is that inflation should be driven by expected inflation, by uh, the uh, sm uh, sm small cap X, uh, which is the output gap or any measure of activity we, we've seen uh, uh, Jim presenting this morning. And, and then the, the capital X is a bunch of external things 
uh, or exogenous things, and uh, everybody has his uh, uh, favorite list, and there is a, a big literature estimating these things, and uh, as Christine will explain, yes, that's happening, and beta is stronger than alpha, and increasingly over time. Now, the problem is that even when you take account all of that, this kind of equation, uh, of equation generally don't do a good job empirically. Uh, and what seems to be doing a better job empirically and, uh, is the approximating uh, expected inflation with past inflation. Uh, that's sort of what, what we, I think uh, uh, the literature has showing. Now, uh, so if that, if that works, that's the uh, surviving a long surviving Phillips curve, uh, the uh, output gap or any activity measure has, a, has an increasingly weak and unstable effect. What's happening elsewhere or what is exogenous is beyond reach of central banks. Uh, and uh, if the past is what determines inflation, not expected inflation, uh, then we are stuck with the past. And so that, so again, looking at the data I showed before, uh, there was a big negative X sometimes around 2008-9, uh, we just got down, and uh, the effect of this cyclical condition is weary, uh, weak, and as long as X is zero, uh, all that's happening is inflation today, is inflation yesterday or last year, and uh, there are little bubbles uh, here and there, but not much is happening. And that's sort of my simple-minded uh, summary of, uh, of why uh, inflation has been low and, and is sticking low staying low. Now, what are the implications? Um, so the question was, what is the persistence, the implications of persistently low inflation on macroeconomic condition in the euro area? That was. So um, it, it goes back a little bit to what uh, Larry was uh, talking yesterday about monetary policy effects in, on real variables. Here, uh, the question is, um, uh, impact of inflation, low inflation, on economic performance. And again, my understanding of what we seem to be uh, agreeing upon is that if it's stable, uh, so infl when inflation is stable uh, and has stabilized and remains stabilized and expected to remain stabilized, then it doesn't have any real effect. So it's a variation of the neutrality. When it moves and it kicks, we discussed that abundantly, it has effect, but it, when it stays uh, at a low level, it doesn't uh, have much an effect, or an effect on uh, uh, the real life, growth, uh, employment, whatever. Uh, now, of course, one exception of that is that if central banks uh, try to deal with low inflation or very too low inflation given their target, and they start uh, doing all the things that they can do, um, then, then they, and, and they do it more and more of it because the uh, Phillips curve effect is weak. So if they want to raise inflation, they have to do big, uh, big time monetary policy. Uh, then, then, uh, then things can happen. Uh, and of course, uh, the role of fiscal policy is also in the background. I think we, we've seen fiscal policy uh, pretty weak until recently in, in the US, but certainly in the euro area, nothing much has happened. Uh, so uh, there, there isn't much happening on, on, the, on the real side, except maybe of the uh, uh, effects of the uh, very expansionary monetary policy. Uh, so all the discussions about distortions, uh, risk on, on financial market, and so on and so forth, that, that's, that's, that may be a, an issue, and that everybody's aware of that. Now, there is, a, there is an interesting question of the exchange rate, so it's part of the, in a way, it's what's happening abroad, or it's our relationship uh, with, the, with the rest of the world. I think the evidence here is that the effect is in, in increasingly muted, but still, it's, it's, it's this permanent temptation, uh, the bigger thy neighbor temptation. Now, one of the things that we have observed, at least along, among the developed countries, uh, is that the temptation to play around with the exchange rate has been largely resisted. There have been movement, movement in the exchange rates, but um, they were not really attempts by the authorities uh, to, play, uh, to, to play with that and have an X, the capital X, that help uh, achieve the inflation target. Um, so that, that is, I think, is, is important. Uh, 
uh, for our understanding of monetary policy at the global level, or at least among the developed countries, uh, assuming they can do something about the exchange rate, which wasn't discussed this morning, and that the exchange rate can have powerful effect on, on inflation, uh, although th there is evidence it's becoming also less, less powerful, uh, there has been uh, some implicit or explicit discussions uh, among uh, uh, saddle banks, saddle bankers uh, here, uh, and uh, it has avoided a possibly negative, uh, bigger than neighbor policy. Uh, now there is the very special case of the euro area member countries, uh, they don't have exchange rates. Uh, so uh, that in a way backfires because there is hardly anything they can do if they would like to do. They, they cannot have monetary policies that uh, uh, are, are, are bigger than neighbor, but there are, there are fiscal policies uh, that could be used and, and this hasn't been used, but it's a permanent uh, source of tension. Uh, so this aspect is, is, uh, is, is one of the uh, uh, underlying uh, consequences of, of this low inflation. Now, uh, finally, um, I was asked uh, implications of monetary policy on the transmission mechanism, but I, I, I didn't think that was interesting. Uh, question. I wanted to, to zoom uh, directly uh, to monetary policy. Um, so my, my understanding, again, of, of what we have seen and, 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 and much research is that inflation targeting remains the best strategy. Uh, there hasn't been uh, much of a challenge to that. A number of people like to say it hasn't worked, but I don't think it's true. There, there is this sort of bubbling return of a suggestion to have nominal GDP targeting. So it comes now and then uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, and I think there is a, it's a smart idea, but the, it raises a more question than it answers of first, how do you measure GDP? How precise, how soon you know it? And, and so on and so forth. So if, if this morning we were told that the consumer, the pr consumer price index is badly measured, uh, in real time, certainly uh, measuring non GDP is, is open to 10 times more uh, difficulty, and I think that's a good reason why it's likely uh, we should stick with inflation targeting. Now, the interest rate instrument remains the, the lo logical instrument. Uh, in the history of the uh, ECB, it's not an obvious conclusion. Early on, there were deep debate about uh, what should be done. I think uh, the, the debate is, is I mean, the, the evidence is that it remains a, uh, the, the right instrument, except that there is a lower bound, and except that we've hit the lower bound and we are at the war, lower bound. Now, the answer is a QE, and I think that's, uh, that's the, 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 the proper thing to do. Uh, there is the Japanese uh, uh, fine-tuning uh, on shaping the, the, the yield curve when you're at zero lower bound. So my impression, and that's also what I think I heard from Larry Summers yesterday, we are more or less in terms of the fundamentals where we were before uh, the crisis. Uh, there has been, of course, a lot of critical discussions, but at the end of the day, uh, the things are okay. There is this new uh, instruments of QE and, and possibly uh, long-term, uh, affecting the long-term interest rate directly, not just through expectation. Uh, and that's probably the best we, we can have. Now, is everything fine? Certainly not. Uh, and uh, there are good reasons to, to, to worry. Um, and I want to take a particular line on top of all the things we've heard, including uh, the, 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 the dangerous impact of uh, very low interest rate for very long and bubbles and all of those things, which are well known. Uh, just, just following on what we heard this morning, uh, what, what, we, what is clear is uh, hitting the inflation targeting is very, has proven much more difficult uh, since the crisis than, than we thought. Uh, here again, I, I bring back this, uh, this data. So the above one are the euro and Switzerland. The other one is uh, in gray, the US, and in green, the, the, the UK. Uh, with the targets, uh, well, Switzerland has a zero-two target, uh, 
Uh, now, what, what we see from the US and the UK is assuming the target is 2%, which it wasn't in the, in the Fed, I mean, there was no target, but assuming that the inflation, assume, uh, inflation target is 2%, what we have seen is, in contrast to the ECB and the Swiss National Bank, in the UK, the average inflation over the whole period has indeed been 2%, so success, except that the variations from year to year considerable and uh, that just measuring the standard deviation is about one percent uh, so if you if you start asking how often are the central banks likely to be near the target uh, the answer is not very often because the, there is just so much variability uh, so now that matter uh, that matter because precision is if the precision that of the things that central banks can do is, is are very imprecise uh, even uh, in, in, the, in the medium run, because uh, we never get in the medium run, as we know, um, then th th there's a question of how central banks should go about uh, doing the inflation targeting. Uh, for, for these reasons, and also because of the financial stability mandate, which is one of the other innovations in most countries, uh, that central banks have sometimes to forget about uh, the financial the uh, inflation st price stability mandate and, and worry about financial stability and do all sorts of things. So all of that, in my mind, is not challenging the inflation uh, target a strategy, but uh, it is challenging the way uh, we've been going uh, out of it. Now, the natural I uh, implication is that uh, if, if, if we are hitting to try a target with a very imprecise instrument, uh, it would make sense to have a wider margin. And so that's an ongoing discussion. Yesterday, Larry said, uh, because of the very low real interest rates, uh, you want to have a, uh, you want to move your margin. Uh, that's not the argument. My impression is that by trying to, to stay within the margin that it is impossible to stay within, uh, central bank create trouble for themselves. It's not just a question of credibility, it's a question of constraint on policy deliberation and, and, and the way it's, it's, it's acting. Uh, now, the second thing, and it comes directly from this discussion this morning, uh, that, I mean, Yuri's paper, uh, makes the important point that firms and consumers respond uh, when, to information when they are, uh, they are given the information, but they don't listen to central banks. Uh, they don't care. They don't even know what is the inflation rate. Uh, now, to me, the, the way to improve precision is to actually uh, talk to these people in their language, which is, again, what, what you de developed this morning. And here, I would like to try to do a little bit of a provocation, uh, which is uh, time. Okay. I don't have time to do my minus provocation. Seven. Mi minus seven. Okay. <laughs> J just very quickly. Uh, my perception is that, again, that what Yuri said, talk a simple language. Now, central bankers talk a very complex, sophisticated, convoluted language because they talk to financial markets. And in, as a first approximation, financial markets don't matter beyond the very short run. I know there is this transmission uh, thing. But they, they don't really matter. And I would submit that it would be... a a great progress in monetary policy if central bankers would stop talking to financial market, let them, <laughs> let them take the risk uh, and probably reduce the risk taking because they would have less spoon feeding uh, and talk way more to the people in the streets who mistrust the central banks, who don't understand anything, but who are the people who matter for, uh, for inflation. Uh, and that's the end of my provocation. Thanks, Charles. Food for discussion. Okay, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a, a big supporter of this conference. I think it pro plays a very important role in uh, bringing together uh, a lot of people who think about monetary policy and exchange via. I titled this the uh, case of the disappearing Phillips curve, but we could also do this as a murder mystery, who killed the uh, Phillips curve? 
and I'm afraid the suspects are in this room. <laughs> so the slope of the Phillips curve was uh, negative in the 80s, but has been drifting towards zero in the inflation targeting era, which I'm going to date from 1995. Uh, that's an approximate date, but the inflation hit 2% in the U.S., and I would implicitly the Greenspan Fed and adopted a 2% inflation target. We often call this a flattening Phillips curve. We've, often, we've already referred to it uh, basically in all the comments today. Now at the same time, monetary authorities have improved uh, monetary policy during the inflation targeting era, and I'm not going to provide direct evidence of that, but I'll, I'll just state that uh, inflation has been lower, uh, closer to target. The variability of inflation has been lower. The variability of inflation expectations has been lower in the countries that have uh, inflation targeting. So uh, that's what I'm calling the inflation targeting era, and that's in stark contrast to the earlier pre-inflation targeting era, the pre-1995 era. I'm going to argue that these two phenomena are linked, that the improved monetary policy in this sense has led to the flatter Phillips curve, and I'll draw out the implications for monetary policy after making my core argument, and I'm going to talk in very dense, complicated central banking language. Um, the empirical evidence uh, has been shown already in several different ways, but I like this particular presentation, which I'm taking from the BIS uh, annual report 2017. Uh, this data is for a paddle, panel of G7 economies. The coefficient is estimated, the coefficient, uh, the key coefficient, the Phillips curve coefficient in a preferred specification is estimated for rolling 15 year samples uh, from the 1980s to the present. So we're going to see how this coefficient evolves in the picture. Uh, from the 1980s to the present, and the point estimate will be the weighted average across economies, GDP weighted. So this is the picture you get uh, the, uh, in the 80s. Um, you might have had a coefficient here on the order of minus 2 in this regression, and as you move forward with the rolling samples, it gets to be minus 1 uh, in about 1990, and it goes all the way to 0 at the end sample, and even the point estimate is slightly positive at the very end of the sample. So I'm calling this the disappearing uh, Phillips curve over the uh, period since 1980. So let's write down a model, um, and let's, uh, I'm going to use a simple and standard model. Uh, it's probably not totally convincing because it's too simple, but it is a version of more complicated models that underlie almost all uh, of modern analysis of uh, central banking. And it's the beloved uh, three equation New Keynesian uh, model with an IS equation, number one, New Keynesian curve, number two, and monetary policy conducted at using a Taylor type monetary rule, number three. Um, y is the output gap, pi is an inflation gap, I is the policy instrument, uh, rho is the real interest rate, which is subject to a shock. There are two shocks here, the, the epsilon and the U. Uh, there are some structural parameters, uh, sigma, kappa, beta, which are all positive. And critically, there are two policy parameters, the phi pi and the phi y, which are the policy matrices in the uh, policy rule. So if you figure out the rational expectations equilibrium of this, you find out that the gap and the inflation gap evolve according to a linear function of the shocks in the model, the epsilon and the u are in the, in the numerators in this, these expressions, but also uh, that the policy parameters enter these uh, expressions. So now let's turn to monetary policy, and we're going to try to frame something that gets at this idea of better and better uh, monetary policy over time. So I'm going to look for monetary policy, but I'm going to do so uh, in a special way. There are many ways to talk about optimal policy in this model. I'm going to do one particular way. I'm going to constrain the policymaker to stick to the uh, Taylor type rule that I've given the policymaker. And I'm going to, uh, uh, the policymaker gets to fix uh, any fee Y that they want. Um, and then we're going to uh, minimize a quadratic function here, equation six, um, by choosing just one parameter, phi pi. 
And uh, this, you notice that this minimization has an alpha in it. The alpha is the relative weight in the objective function on inflation stabilization. But it turns out if you solve the problem this way, it doesn't really matter what the alpha is. The solution is actually to send phi pi to a larger and larger number, over, uh, which uh, technically to go all the way to infinity. So that's going to be very useful in the next, uh, in the next slide here. So optimal policy would be uh, interpreted as uh, that policymakers should promise to react very aggressively to deviations of inflation from target in conducting monetary policy. I'm going to use that as a summary statement of what has happened since the 1980s in the G7 economies and broader uh, across the OECD economies, that policymakers have become more and more obsessed and more and more aggressive in responding to deviations of inflation from target. Um, and uh, you might say, uh, gee, Jim, this doesn't include uh, unconventional policy, but I want to think of the unconventional policies all encapsulated here in that policymakers were willing to do extraordinary things uh, when the crisis hit to make sure that inflation did not go too negative and did not go too far away from the target. So there again, I think uh, this captures the spirit of a more and more aggressive uh, monetary policy, uh, inflation targeting policy over time. Okay, so now I'm going to, do, uh, now I'm going to put on my econometrician hat. Uh, I'll be Jim Stock here for a minute and uh, run a regression of the uh, inflation gap and the output gap uh, inside the model. And we'll call that estimated coefficient the slope of the empirical Phillips curve. And because this model is so simple, this uh, empirical Phillips curve slope is going to be able to be calculated directly. Uh, as this formula number seven here. And if you look at this formula a little bit, you see these uh, structural parameters, kappa, sigma. Uh, you see the variances of the shock, sigma uh, epsilon and sigma squared u. But you also see the policy parameter phi pi in the denominator. And in fact, if you take the limit of the right-hand side of this, you will get zero as phi pi goes to infinity. So as I've defined monetary policy, phi pi is going to infinity. As phi pi goes to, into, to infinity, the slope of the Phillips curve literally goes to zero in this model. So this is the main uh, point I wanted to make. Now, uh, is this empirically relevant, you might say? Uh, so uh, this is a very simple model, a stylized model. Uh, what happens if we go to more uh, serious models? So we did, um, we did something, uh, we did two things about this. Um, one is uh, this lubick shorfite uh, estimates, which are from 2004, so that's before the crisis. They estimated a model very similar to this, and we took their numbers and uh, used Oaken's law to get to uh, the unemployment version. And if you do that in, with their estimates, you'll get, uh, and, and let phi pi get larger and larger, you will get this picture. Uh, which is very similar to the one I was showing you uh, at the, in the beginning. As phi pi gets larger and larger, the slope coefficient uh, goes towards zero. Uh, in this model, with phi pi equal to one or less than one, you'd have a very negative slope uh, of the Phillips curve, similar to the one we might have seen circa 1990 or 1988 or 1985. Uh, but as phi pi got higher and higher, uh, this would go towards zero. So this is one way to say that maybe this is uh, empirically relevant. Um, there are other, I'm certainly not the first person to make this point, and this has actually been hinted at uh, by people in the audience already today. Uh, but I'll just do a very partial uh, review of a few pieces of literature that uh, would support this point. This has been published literature over the last well, you could say since Lucas, but uh, certainly over the last uh, decade or more. Uh, Bovina and Giannani, for instance, uh, this paper, Del Negro, Giannani, and Shrafaiti, um, actually tried to address the um, missing deflation after the crisis in a DSG model. They made an argument that's very similar to the one I'm making here. And then this last paper, McLeay and Tenreno wrote, um, they actually do, this is a very recent paper, this last one, so I'll promote it here a little bit. They do a better job than I'm doing in these slides of analyzing this more extensively and pointing out the, uh, the 
uh, the identification problem that would arise from all kinds of versions of this model and this kind of exercise here. So I would rec if you're interested in this exercise, I'd recommend that, uh, that paper. So they would say the Phillips curve can't be easily identified in the data because of this, the problem that I'm outlining here, the Lucas critique kind of problem. So what should we do as uh, policymakers? Um, uh, this is my last slide. Um, I think we have to look for a different signal. Ultimately, successful monetary policy can push the empirical Phillips curve slope all the way to zero, according to this analysis. Uh, of course, the structural Phillips curve is still there. The friction is still in the model. It's the empirical Phillips curve that's disappearing. Uh, but what that means is that uh, as policymakers, we probably can't take a signal, uh, a reliable signal, based on empirical Phillips curve relationships that we estimate. Uh, so we're going to have to look elsewhere in order to get a signal for monetary policy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. Can I, can I get the first polling question from the technicians there? I hope you uh, use the application for the answers. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit more difficult this year. You get the question? Yeah. Can the Phillips curve, i.e. the relation between slack and inflation, be described as alive and well in advancing economies today? Press number one if you think that yes, but slack and or inflation is not measured accurately enough. Press two if yes, but it is not near, and hence inflation reacts with the lag when slack is large. Press three if no, it is flatter or weaker than in the past. And number four, no, traditional Phillips curve is that the fluctuation in inflation can largely be attributed to factors other than domestic slack, such as uh, external factors, shifts in expectations, sunspots. <laughs> so cast your vote. Let's see. You have 15 Let's seconds. See. I think many didn't. Download the application. From yeah, the, uh, uh, if I you don't have the, uh, the app, you can download it from the App Store or it's Google Play. Late. It's too late. Or if you need some help, you can uh, reach us uh, at the booth downstairs. So, can we go? Can we see the results? Here's the results. Ah, there it is. Mixed. Christine, <laughs> okay. it's time to, to go. Well, thank you very much. Actually, it's, I will argue that more than one of those answers is correct. So uh, that's probably why it's been hard to get consensus. Could I have my slides up at some point? Thank you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. And yes, Peter, I know that the topic of the panel is not um, Mariner Instruments. Um, but I thought I'd, given that we've had a long, intense morning, come at the questions we're looking at from a slightly different angle. So hopefully you have had uh, some time to do some sightseeing in the area. If so, you've probably learned about Prince Henry of Portugal, also known as Prince Henry the Navigator. He's one of the great mariners credited for the age of discoveries in Portugal. And he, as many of the Portuguese mariners, relied heavily on the astrolab to get assessed latitude when they were sailing and how far their ships had come. So imagine if you're Prince Henry and your astrolab starts to malfunction. And it consistently overpredicts how far your ship has gone. Somewhat like central bankers, all our models are consistently overpredicting the return of inflation. What should Prince Henry do? Should he get rid of this instrument, get rid of our inflation models, and go for a new model or a new instrument to predict where his ships have come? Or should he give up on instruments, give up on models, as some have suggested, just sail by his gut, by his landmarks, by the wind? Some people suggested maybe central bankers should rely less on our models. Or third, should Prince Henry try to fix the astrolab, tweak it, make it work better, figure out why it's not working well? Um, similarly, should we try to fix our inflation models? And that's going to be my point today, is I don't think we should throw out our basic inflation models. I think there is still some grain of uh, parts working there, but we do need to adjust them and fix them to make them work better. And I'm going to argue at least one of the key factors that's missing that will make them work better is to better account for globalization and changes in the global economy. It is amazing how domestically focused our models of inflation still are, 
given the substantial increases in global integration that have happened. But before I get to that and before I make those arguments, I want to just take a step back and think about whether inflation really is too low. That's a key premise of the, the panel today, key premise of these two days here, that inflation is lower than it should be given the stage of the business cycle and the falls in unemployment and closing of output gaps around the world. But of course, that assumption, inflation is too low, comes from our models that we're all questioning how accurate they are. So I thought it's useful just before I get into how to fix these models or how we can improve on them, take a step back and say, really, how low is inflation? And there I found it useful um, when I struggled with these questions at the Bank of England to, is a cross check to do trend cycle analysis of inflation. This is a way to take a step back. Um, Lucretia introduced us to the, this this morning. Take a step back. Don't make assumptions about how you measure slack, lag structure, you know, the whole set of assumptions that go into these models. Instead, just look at the statistical properties of inflation and separate inflation into two components, a slow moving and persistent trend, which would be the target of central banks and monetary policy, and then the temporary cyclical movements around the trend that you can largely ignore, but can drive headline inflation rates and even core inflation rates. Like this framework, minimal assumptions needed, no need to parameterize, and it allows the models to automatically be flexible over time. There's a few different ways to do this. I'm going to use a technique I developed at the Bank of England with two colleagues there called an ARSB model. But basically, all of these models build on the seminal work by Stock and Watson, which use a UCSV model um, to basically do this statistical decomposition. I'm going to basically use the Stock and Watson model, but add an autoregressive component in the error term, which is something Steve Cicchetti and others have suggested doing. So no time to go into the technical details, but basically break down inflation into a slow moving trend and then a shorter term cyclical movement. And I, that's what I do. I'm gonna start with the two countries uh, where inflation is about at target or above target, the US and UK. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of these graphs that are all set up the same way. Black is headline inf or CPI inflation or core inflation in the US, headline inflation for the others closer to your targets. Uh, this is quarterly. Uh, inflation annualized and seasonally adjusted. Um, the blue is the slow moving trend and the red is the cyclical component. These graphs are interesting to look at. There's a lot in there about what drives inflation, how much is slow moving trend, how much is cyclical. Um, but I just for the, given the time constraints, want to focus on what does this suggest about where trend inflation is relative to targets? Um, especially given that headline inflation is picking up in another, a number of countries. You know, how much of that is underlying inflation and how much is more temporary effects of oil prices? So what you see for the U.S. is that uh, underlying core inflation, trend, infl or trend inflation, is pretty close to the target. My sample ends in the fourth quarter of 2017, and it's 1.9 percent, and it's gone up a bit since then. You see that some of the weakness in inflation in the U.S. in 2017 that got a lot of attention is identified as just cyclical in this. UK is one of the few countries, actually one of the only countries in my sample, where inf uh, underlying inflation is actually well above the 2% targets. It's at 2.7% at the end of 2017. So these are countries where underlying inflation is basically at or a bit above uh, inflation targets. Now let's go to the rest of the world. Is uh, inf low inflation still an issue? So let's start with, in honor of the president of the ECB, Italy, and in honor of where we are, Portugal. Uh, what does this say about uh, trend inflation? And this is, these graphs are pretty typical of most countries in the euro area. You see big cyclical drags on inflation during the global financial crisis and the periods of concerns about euro debt problems. But overall, you see this pretty steady downward shift in underlying trend inflation. So trend inflation at the end of 2017 is still well below the 2% inflation target. Um, if you look at some of the other uh, economies in the euro area, um, say France and Germany, you see, again, in headline inflation is picking up, CPI inflation is picking up, but according to this decomposition, a good part of that is cyclical, is the red. Underlying trend, the more permanent component of inflation, is still quite a bit below the 2% inflation target. Um, moving outside the euro area, do the same uh, thing for other countries. You see some very different experiences in other advanced economies. So here I picked two countries where uh, unemployment is probably at or below Nehru, pretty solid growth, but yet countries that have struggled with getting inflation up. Sweden inflation has picked up, has recently been about 2%. Uh, but the, some of that pickup is underlying trend inflation, but still got a ways to go to get to 2%. Japan, 
you squint, you see that that trend inflation is coming up, but there's still a long way to go to get it up to a level consistent with 2% inflation. Um, I could show you a lot of these graphs, but I think that you get the point. Underlying trend inflation in most countries around the world is still quite low. So people organizing this conference, you might have been worried that now headline inflation is getting up there. It looks like we don't have a problem more in a lot of the world. But if you look at these top decompositions, a good part of that pickup is cyclical. And there still is a reason for monetary policy accommodation in a lot of the world. Underlying trend inflation has still not come back to levels you'd like to see consistent with target. So what's going on? So there is a disconnect. Uh, there is a disconnect between pretty solid growth, falls in unemployment rates, output gaps are getting close to closed or closed in many economies, and this low underlying trend inflation. So we've heard a number of stories about what's going on. Is it how we measure inflation, how we measure slack, inflation expectations? We just heard about credibility of central banks. Uh, there's been some nice work at the BIS suggesting global slack should be included. Um, my read of all this literature is that there is something to each of these arguments. I think each of these factors has played some role, is important. Um, each of these does help improve our models and understanding of this um, underperformance of inflation. But what I think is also missing, which is more and more important over time, is a better incorporation of changes in the global economy. You know, it really is amazing when you think about how much globalization has proceeded since the Phillips curve was developed, how integrated the global economy has become, and yet how little we make any adjustment for that in our basic Phillips curve models. I mean, look at the models we've looked at today. You know, with due respect to the authors who presented, uh, they did what's typical in a lot of the uh, literature. There's no control for what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, some estimates that are a bit more progressive have one variable, which is oil prices or import prices, is their way to capture what's going on in the rest of the world. And there's this argument in the literature that if you control for domestic slack in, say, oil prices or import prices, that should be a sufficient statistic to capture changes in the global economy and how that affects inflation. Um, but my read of the evidence is that there have been more fundamental changes. We need to better think about what's going on in the rest of the world when modeling domestic inflation. So for example, trade flows have increased. So if a country imports more, then imports are larger share of the CPI index. So just mechanically, changes in exchange rates or imported prices will have a bit bigger impact on inflation. If countries export more, then changes in global demand are going to have more of an impact on how firms set prices. Uh, emerging markets play a much greater role in global growth and global demand. They're driving sharper volatility in commodity prices which could affect pricing, especially if effects are nonlinear. There's also quite a bit of work on the greater use of supply chains. Much easier to shift parts of production to where it can be done more cheaply, and that's going to affect bargaining power of local workers, for example. So just a couple examples, but there have been some pretty fundamental changes in the global economy that are going to affect inflation, and we really are not working them into our models well. So what happens if you do put some of these factors into just our simple models of inflation? So I'm going to show you a few pieces of evidence that show that adding them will help improve our models. Not solve everything, but go some way. So first, I'm just going to estimate a simple Phillips curve um, with all of the problems. Um, and I'm going to estimate it on quarterly inflation for a pooled sample of countries, about 40 countries, 1970 to 2017, for CPI inflation and core inflation. Um, and I'm going to include the standard Phillips curve variables at the top, inflation expectations, lagged inflation, and the domestic output gap. And I measure the domestic output gap as a principal component of all sorts of different measures that could go into slack um, to try to get around the issues with that measurement. And what you see at the top of this, the coefficients all come in positive and significant, which is what you'd expect. Uh, higher inflation expectations, higher lagged inflation, larger positive domestic output gap correlated with higher inflation. So standard Phillips curve variables still work in a pooled cross-section of countries over time. But then I also include a set of global variables or global factors. The exchange rate, world output gap, oil prices, commodity prices, X energy, and a measure of PPI dispersion to capture pricing pressure in supply chains. Each of those coefficients also comes in significant in just about all cases with the expected sign. So exchange rate depreciations, larger world output gap, Higher world oil prices, higher world commodity prices, and more dispersed producer prices are all correlated with higher inflation. 
So this is just one piece of evidence. These global variables do seem to matter, at least in a pooled cross-section of countries. They do significantly improve the adjusted R-squareds. But if you estimate these for separate countries, one caveat, the model doesn't look quite so good. Um, if you estimate the same equations, just one country at a time, rarely do you get these great results where everything comes in with the right sign and significant. Instead, in most countries, you get you know, three or four of the different variables coming in with the expected sign and significant. Usually, you get at least one or a set of global variables, but usually not all. But when you look at the differences across countries, it is pretty intuitive. Um, for example, if you do this just for Germany, you find that inflation expectations, lagged inflation, and the world output gap are all significantly correlated with inflation. If you do it for Iceland, you get totally different results. None of the variables important for Germany are consistently significant, but instead for Iceland, the domestic output gap, oil prices, and the exchange rate are the ones significantly correlated with inflation. So you can do this country by country. You get pretty intuitive results. Different variables matter in terms of determining inflation in different countries. But that also does make it hard to generalize across countries and results. Um, but overall, global variables do matter in most countries around the world and improve the explanatory power of the aggressions. It's just different variables matter more for different countries. World output gap matters more for Germany. Exchange rates and oil prices matter more for Iceland. So that's one challenge in estimating these models. The other challenge, which we actually just saw in the last presentation, is the coefficients on these variables can change quite a bit over time. The role of these global factors, as well as domestic factors, do vary. Um, so just, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures to make this point, um, but this also is why estimating these models can be hard. To, what I'm gonna do is estimate the same model, um, same cross-section of countries, uh, 1990 to 2017, but now allow the coefficients to roll over time, over eight-year rolling windows. And then I'm gonna take each of these coefficient estimates and look at what happens to it for the median country in the sample. And let's do that, say, for the real exchange rate. So this is the coefficient on the real exchange rate. The first half of the sample, coefficient average is about minus 0.05. So what that implies for the median country, a 10% depreciation is correlated with the 0.5% increase in CPI inflation. Um, over the next two years. So that's sort of logical, fits with estimates of pass-through, suggests exchange rate movements are important in affecting inflation in many countries around the world. But then you look at what happens around the time of the global financial crisis. The coefficient goes from, as expected, negative to basically zero, and then briefly positive. And now it's coming back closer to the uh, sort of pre-crisis average. Um, this changes in the, amount, in the effect of exchange rates on inflation could be explained by different shocks causing the exchange rate movement. For example, if the exchange rate is moving more during, due to demand shocks during the crisis, that would cause less pass-through. Um, but the bottom line is the effect of these global factors does vary over time. Here's another one to show you how the effect varies over time. The impact of commodity price, X energy um, uh, movements on inflation. Movements in commodity prices didn't seem to have much effect on inflation outside of oil before the global financial crisis. Since then, movements in commodity prices seem to be having a much bigger effect on inflation in countries around the world, especially CPI inflation. This might be because commodity price movements are more correlated with demand in emerging markets, so this could capture a global demand effect. Um, but the bottom line is this is a global factor now having much more effect on inflation that didn't matter in the past. So it understood why it wasn't included in models. Um, we've talked about the decline of the Phillips curve. So I also, here's a happens to the coefficient on domestic slack when you do these rolling regressions. Get similar results to Jim, where the coefficient seems to become less important. Well, uh, you get the expected positive coefficient, larger positive output gap correlated with higher inflation pre-crisis. Then it falls to just about zero, but it is starting to come back at the end of 2017. So maybe the Phillips curve is re-emerging, um, which would be uh, consistent with theories that there are non-linearities. So bottom line of all of this, adding global variables to models trying to explain inflation do seem to be important. Global variables do seem to play an important role, but their effect varies over time making it hard to measure and why you can get some different results in different papers on whether these global variables matter. Um, the, their weight does change over time. So as a last graph I'll show you um, is how important are they? Okay, so it can show you nice significant coefficients, lots of stars, it suggests that they're significant, but are they meaningful? How much will adding these global variables actually reduce the errors in our inflation models? <laughs> 
So as a last test for that, what I did is I took the same rolling coefficients of this model, where I have the standard domestic variables plus uh, the five extended global variables, estimate the model for each country, trying to predict inflation, quarterly inflation, um, again, using rolling regression coefficients, so you allow the variables or effect of the variables to change over time. Then you take the predicted coefficient for each country, plug in the actual values for each country, and then look at what predicted inflation is using this model, and then look at the deviation of predicted inflation from actual inflation. And I'm going to do that once with a full model with all these variables in there, and then look at the gap between actual inflation and predicted inflation if you just include the domestic variables, don't include the global variables. So it's sort of a rough test of basically what's the error from the model with and without global variables. And if you do that, this is the squared error terms, uh, you get a graph like this. And again, what you want is these numbers to be smaller. Close to zero means the model is perfect, that it exactly predicts actual inflation. Higher up means your model is not working terribly well and you're getting some bigger errors. In the black is what the model predicts when you only use your standard Phillips curve variables, your domestic variables. The red is the errors when you include your global variables. And what you see is adding the global variables isn't going to make the models perfect. There's still some misses. You still get some numbers above zero. Um, but it does reduce the errors by a meaningful amount. And it particularly reduces the errors by a meaningful amount during the global financial crisis and most recently from about 2012 to 2016. And this is an era where the global variables do seem to play a more important role and really have affected the inflation process in a more meaningful way. So adding them to the inflation models, it's not going to make them perfect, but it does meaningfully reduce the errors you get. Um, last, Peter had asked, so which global variables matter? Um, I wish I could have said, give it, showed you this graph and said, you just have to add one. Just add the world output gap. Just add the exchange rate. And you'll close this gap between the black lines and the red lines. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, different global variables seem to matter more for different countries. So you really do need a more comprehensive set of global controls. There's no one magic bullet. You need to incorporate different aspects of global globalization and global integration. Um, but I will skip the regression results in the interest of time and just sum up. So what comes through when you do this more formally is, as Jim said, tech it up um, with more formal regression analysis. Um, it, the results do suggest that global factors should be included more comprehensively in inflation models, but you also do need to allow parameters to evolve over time. Many of the global variables were not as important before 2009. More recently, they're playing a bigger role. Which factor is the most important? Exchange rates do seem to matter across the whole period in predicting CPI or core inflation. Over the last decade, commodity prices and global slack seems to matter quite a bit more and particularly improves the explanatory of models explaining CPI inflation. Domestic slack seems to be less important in predicting inflation, especially in advanced economies with their own currencies. Um, the bottom line, back to uh, Prince Henry and his astrolab. Um, I'm in the camp of don't throw out the Phillips curve models, don't throw out our old models, uh, but we do need to adjust them. We should, it is past time, given the globalization that has occurred, to explicitly and comprehensively incorporate global variables, global factors into our inflation models. Um, similarly, the Portuguese, supposedly, their innovation to make their astrolabs work better was to find stable land, or at least a very calm day, and then their astrolabs worked a lot better. It seems like a small innovation. It seems pretty obvious, uh, but it did make them much more efficient at reading latitude. And similar, I think this adaptation to our uh, Phillips curve type models, adding global variables, not a huge innovation, but it can significantly improve their accuracy. Thank you. Thank you. So good. <laughs> Uh, as the last speaker, I predicted there'd be a lot of slides uh, already produced, uh, so I decided uh, no slides. And it also means uh, I can maybe uh, respond a little bit to some, some of the uh, previous uh, contributions. But my order uh, from Peter was actually talk about uh, how central banks should respond. Because uh, there might be temptation uh, listening to some of what we heard this morning basically to be uh, a bit nihilistic, saying, who the hell knows? Uh, inflation is low. We can't find... Uh, uh, factors that, that would uh, help to track inflation and so on. Uh, and I think uh, we could have had a, a lot of these, uh, this discussion a few years ago. So if we had this, we, we, if we went back to uh, 
Sintra 2014, for example, maybe a lot of this discussion would be pretty much the same. Uh, but then, of course, uh, between uh, 2014 and now, uh, the, and I'll just talk about the uh, ECB, maybe Jim can come back on how the Fed has uh, responded in the last four years, is uh, action was taken. And um, it'd be interesting to go back and rerun your online survey and ask, how optimistic are you in summer 2014 about the ability of the ECB to deliver policies that can bring inflation, uh, to use a, a phrase I've heard before, on a sustained path uh, to, to, to the inflation target. And what we've seen over those last four years is that uh, some of the messages we had this morning from Yuri and others, which is, uh, and uh, I think you, you had as well, like aggressive action. If you take aggressive action, uh, if you roll out the package of measures, whether it's going below the zero uh, lower bound, whether it's the APP, whether it's forward guidance, um, we now, four years later, do have evidence that that package uh, does help. So if your initial condition is a lot of slack, far away from uh, what you might consider uh, a busy European economy, and if you can see that some of the obvious transmission mechanisms are far uh, away from what, what might be considered normal. So if funding conditions are high, uh, if lending rates are high compared to what you might expect, then having an effective monetary policy can do quite a bit. And uh, what we've seen over those years is a, is a big change of financial conditions. So unlike Charles, I do think uh, no matter what we may think of the financial system, uh, the transmission mechanism does work through financial conditions. So communicating clearly and uh, persistently about the, the uh, effect of these policies, uh, explaining to the market is very important in moving the funding costs that matter for financial intermediaries. So I do think uh, we now have a, a lot of evidence uh, from that, that we saw a big decline in financial conditions. Uh, I agree with Kristen that the role of global factors changes over time. So in uh, 2014, uh, early, the first quarter of 2015, the exchange rate moved a lot. Uh, then for a couple of years, the exchange rate did nothing. It was pretty much flat. So uh, there was a big initial uh, response from the, from the external sector. But then that provided time for domestic parts of the economy to take over. And what we've seen by and large since then is a broad balanced uh, recovery where the decline in lending rates has allowed private consumption to take over. And more recently, uh, business investment and even more recently, uh, household investment in terms of construction and so on. So the transmission that monetary policy is effective in moving financial conditions, in turn financial conditions can uh, move the read economy, and then increasingly we're confident that it also moves the distribution of inflation. Um, all of that is lining up. Uh, so I, I went back last night and I, I looked at Peter's uh, talk to the ECB Watches conference, and one summary measure uh, that Peter talked about there was, if you put all of that together, and if you think about the cumulative impact over uh, a core part of the program from 2016 to 2020, it's adding uh, 1.9 percentage points to your area GDP and 1.9 percentage points to the cumulative uh, inflation path. So, so this is saying uh, central banks are not ineffective. Uh, it's not just a case of being able to move the real economy, as Larry Summers said last night. It's also a case that the distribution of inflation has noticeably shifted. I can very much remember in uh, summer 2014 going to conferences where the belief that that deflation risk was actually going to take over in the euro area, that, that tail has been eliminated, the skew has been eliminated. Uh, we, you know, I would agree that but we're not a target yet. And uh, I think uh, if from, from those who paid attention, the limited number of people who paid attention last week to the ECB uh, policy announcement, uh, in that it's crystal clear that uh, there's still a lot of accommodation is going to be needed. Uh, in order to make sure we persistently get back to target. Uh, let me ask, you know, th that's I think my, my uh, uh, basic point here. It does involve communication because to the extent you're working through the financial conditions, improving the real economy, and in turn the real economy through the model Phillips curve, not necessarily the empirical Phillips curve, then uh, building up wage and price pressures, that takes time. And in that gap, which is, can be quite a number of years, 
in that gap, communication policy is so important. Saying, listen, we're persistent, we're patient, uh, we're going to keep on going, we're going to give you forward guidance to fill that gap. But of course, uh, when you get uh, headwinds, like the movement in oil prices, it doesn't help. Um, and that's why it's so important uh, to, to be able to have a, and it's not just communication by talking, it's communication by acting in terms of policy, but also by research. So this is, in the end, uh, what we do uh, in the Governing Council totally relies on what the staff is doing in delivering evidence. So I can tell you, you know, from my point of view on the Governing Council, what convinces us is not kind of staring at the raw data, it's the fact that the modelers, both in the ECB and the national central banks, are delivering many, and you said this this morning, Peter, many models. Uh, and it, it's not putting your bets on one interpretation of the data or one structural model. It's cutting it in many different ways. We'll give you that uh, kind of increasing reassurance uh, that inflation is on its way. Uh, let me uh, emphasize that this session is about price and wage setting. We haven't heard a huge amount about wage setting this morning. Um, and I think maybe, uh, well, so some people did talk about it, but, uh, you know, I think uh, that this is uh, maybe, and Philip Lowe actually, I think, uh, had it this morning. I mean, where inflation expectations come in big time is in, in that kind of uh, union negotiation. Uh, so I think uh, the communications is also, I think, very much, you said you had an information campaign in Australia. I think in some of our member countries, something similar is going on because it, is a, it would be a mistake to have backwards-looking expectations, which will just slow down the adjustment towards targets. We'll discuss tomorrow. Yeah, so, so I think, I think that, that, that's uh, quite important. Um, so I think uh, I would say also just on this trend cycle debate, uh, John Muehlbauer said this morning that we had a heart attack in uh, 08 or 09. I mean, that sounds right to me. I mean, if you drive the economy, you know, that wasn't a normal cyclical shock. If you drive the economy so far away from uh, normal, uh, it could take a long time to get back to normal. Uh, and so how you handle that in terms, is that a a trend break? Is that a dummy? Is that kind of a, a multi-stage model where you're transitioning between uh, stages? So this is why going back to the ECB, the strategy here, I mean, among the many models, we would have models like that, which would allow for those kind of um, one-off factors or very slow recovery type models. So I mean, that's my personal view, is, is that this is not a typical business cycle episode. Uh, and until we're closer to full employment, uh, we won't get the very strong labour market needed to uh, push up inflation. Jim Stock this morning had something which we talk about in Europe, which is in that um, uh, furniture and uh, home services. Uh, anyone who's in, living in a busy city knows that the cost of getting a plumber, the cost of getting a carpenter, that's shooting up because these guys, they don't care about infection inflation expectations, they just say, what can I charge? And in a busy economy, you can charge a lot more. Um, so we also know that overall wages, uh, negotiated wages are probably moving more slowly, but the uh, opportunities for overtime and so on are, are coming in. Uh, so I think uh, I'm going to be uh, economical here. Uh, I see the clock says I have a minute, but I'm not going to use it. That's, that's fine. So you're very much the, the, other, the other side from what uh, Charles was saying. We are too, mu too, too much preoccupied with markets and experts, you, you conclude, huh, uh, Charles. So, so you insist very much, Philip, on the financial conditions in general, huh? yes. which I agree with you. By the way. <laughs> you want to you wanna react, Charles, on this? Yeah, I mean... It took a very different view from what you were no, saying. No, no, I understand. And, and the, the, the question, I think, is, do you, do, is there an inconsistency between talking to financial markets and talking to the plain people? Because the argument, Phil put well the argument, why you want to talk to financial markets. Right, right. Uh, so but you, you agree? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't, because t t financial markets react extremely strongly to whatever you say. So you tend to develop a communication mode of extreme precision uh, and extreme care. Now, if you want to go down and talk to the plain people, you'll have to talk way more openly and more uh, simply. It doesn't have to be incompatible. Yeah, to exactly. Be. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
but it will be occasionally incompatible. Yeah, but it will not. It will not. Ah, that's something else. <laughs> that's a big difference. That's a big difference. I take questions now with, with great pleasure. Uh, yes? <laughs> I, I know you, I would give you a name. <laughs> I know you too. Funnily yeah, enough. Yeah. Funnily enough. <laughs> <laughs> enough. <laughs> Who are you, by the way? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, Richard Portis, London yeah, Richard. School. Um, <laughs> then I have Luke Rich. Huh? The, then... uh, Kristen's evidence was quite clear. The trend component is down. Um, Charles said uh, that um, we're back to the pre crisis uh, situation, and this this whatever has happened with the Phillips curve doesn't matter much for economic performance. I would put in one qualification. There's a big difference. That is, debt burdens are much higher. And with a lower trend rate of inflation, it is going to be harder to deal with those debt burdens. Uh, and I think we have to address that issue. Um, it's a very important one. Yes, I, I wouldn't kill the cycle uh, so easily. I agree that the trend is, is the big component, but since this is a policy panel, let's maybe, perhaps it's useful to start from our mistake. I mean, mistakes that we know there were mistakes exposed. Uh, the ECB rates were increased uh, in July 2008 uh, and then twice uh, in 2011. And this was when oil was very high but we now know exposed that the recession or the slowdown, substantial slowdown of the economy was kicking in. So this single extraction is super important. So don't be complacent that we have killed it and we can relax because inflation is anchored. I mean, we still, I mean, that may be true at the long horizon, but at the short horizon is super important. And, uh, you know, if you just look at, uh, you know, those two uh, increasing interest rates uh, actually make the difference between uh, U.S. inflation and the euro area inflation. We, we touch almost deflation. And it took a long time to, to reverse that cycle. Let's continue to pick up some, some questions. I have, yes, Thank you. Yeah. Sergei Guri, your colleague, asked me to stand up. Uh, my question is to uh, uh, Christine. Uh, one thing which I think is completely compatible with uh, Jim's presentation is indeed when you showed us the change of parameters over time, you may tell a story that yes, uh, real exchange rates are v very volatile, but central bankers are now much better in uh, sticking to the target. And in that sense, you can tell a story that inflation targeting is now much more uh, aggressive in a sense, and even when oil price goes up and down by factor of two, oil exporters maintain inflation of two or three percent, which is quite amazing if you think about this. My question is to you, did you try also to look at migration in uh, global mobility of labor as a variable? It actually matters for many countries in Central Eastern Europe, population is decreasing by, because of aging, but also because of out migration. And that affects, of course, wages, it affects inflation, and again, over time they manage it much better in the sense that wages grow fast, but inflation is still under control. So uh, yet another global variable to look at as labors become much more mobile than it used to. Yep. One in the back, so I don't see very well. And, and then, uh, Michael, uh, well, uh, oh, Thank you, Angelo Vida from uh, Goldman oh, yes. Sachs. A uh, question for Jim, but uh, for everybody. Did you just restate uh, Goodhart's law, essentially, but saying that uh, when inflation becomes a target, it stops being a useful mm. measure? And if so, how would you run monetary policy then? Um, Stephen Turner. No, there are plenty. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and then, then we, we, we stop. Yes, Yeah, I, I enjoyed uh, both uh, these interventions, yours especially, because you, you point out that the changing exposure to international trade changes uh, price behavior. And you see that in Germany, where Germany has become very globalized in the past 20 years. And Jim's, Jim's uh, point is, is another fundamental point, the Lucas critique. And I wonder why no one's really said that the reason why the Phillips curve doesn't work anymore is because the relative variances have changed, parameters have changed. We know that's happened. So I mean, shouldn't we really 
not be too concerned about the econometrics of the Phillips curve. We know, we've known since 40 years that it depends on the regime. Luigi Zingales, University of Chicago. I would like to link what Christine said with what uh, Jim said earlier this morning, because it seems that uh, in Jim's uh, uh, analysis, the two things that the three things that were working were real estate, hotels, and uh, entertainment. All three are very local and have a huge uh, real estate component in it. So. Uh, this is a bit against what Jim is saying, because if the Philip curves had disappeared, would have disappeared for everything. But it's not disappeared for real estate, it's disappeared for labor. And so maybe is inter internationalization or the loss of, uh, loss of power in uh, the labor and uh, whatever, but that, that makes it uh, one disappear and the other not. Okay, so actually let me start with Luigi, your comment. I actually, as I listened to Jim Stock's presentation earlier, not this Jim, the other Jim's, um, I came to a very different conclusion that our papers were uh, shared, actually came to the same conclusion but from completely different angles. So he found the Phillips curve still works for the components of the price index that are more domestically focused. But yet then he took out all the other stuff that, that's determined globally. And what I say is, instead of taking out a big chunk of the price index, let's actually try to explain what's happening in prices in that big part of the price index. And you need to explain that now, with, not with domestic factors, but with global factors. So in some sense, I see my paper as a way to actually get at, build on what Jim said, but then get at that big component of the price index he isn't able to estimate with his purely your more domestic focus. Um, so I think that that's a, a nice link, actually. Um, then, I, oh, a couple, there was a couple comments on, oh, adding migration. I haven't added that yet. Um, that probably is important for some countries. I was hoping to do all this for wages, but the cross-country wage data across time, where I just wasn't comfortable enough to push it, and that's why I think migration would come in most important. There were also a couple of comments on inflation expectations. So just had one result I didn't have time to show. If you do these rolling regression coefficients with the global variables, it's interesting, one variable coefficient that moves a lot is on inflation expectations. I mean, this would also fit with what you were arguing, Jim, especially around the time of the crisis and after the crisis when we saw very active central banks, you see the estimate of that coefficient on inflation expectations increase quite a bit, suggesting that stable inflation expectations linked to what central banks were doing was very important in supporting inflation during that period when you had large global output gaps and domestic output gaps. So it would be consistent with that story also. Okay. Um, a lot of, <clears throat> lots of great comments here. Um, on the question of debt burdens rising across the developed uh, economies, I'm very sympathetic to this. Some of you know I have research now that has uh, uh, realistic models of debt, and in that model, uh, nominal GDP targeting is actually the thing to do. Uh, so I think this is a very important issue to think about going forward in the world of monetary policy. On the question about Goodhart's law, I think this is very much uh, exactly that, uh, that uh, once something becomes a target, it becomes uh, that you're going to change the correlations around that. How to run monetary policy when this is the case, um, given the discussion this morning, you won't believe this, but I actually think we should uh, focus more on market-based uh, expectations of inflation, I consider those uh, very relevant to day-to-day -day monetary policy making because market, I like it that markets react to the current news. I like it that markets have their own bets on the table about future inflation. I like it that markets take into account all available information. So in the US, they're thinking about what fiscal policy is going to do over the next couple of years. They're thinking about the low unemployment rate. They're thinking about also what the Fed's going to do over the next couple of years. So I think it's a great signal for what I do on a kind of day-to-day -day basis to be looking at uh, market-based inflation expectations because these are people that have real money uh, on the table. So, and that was the whole idea in setting up uh, these kinds of uh, tips markets. And I, I think it's uh, a, a good way to run monetary policy. Right now, those expectations are low. Uh, they remain somewhat below our target, and that gives me a lot of comfort that we're in a good position in U for U.S. monetary policy. On the question of whether, uh, because of the micro, if I decompose the inflation 
into micro components, then I find some correlations with the state of the economy. So the Phillips curve returns for some components. I guess I'm still not quite convinced about this argument. When you go to, when you go to build a price index, you've got a whole bunch of goods, and then you've got to think about how much is being spent on all these goods. And then one of the prices changes, and all those shares uh, change. And then now you say, well, I'm just going to focus on one good, maybe without saying too much about how these shares are changing. I don't, I'm not sure what you're getting there. So I guess what I'd like to see in Professor Stock's paper is a, a toy model that would show me, here's how I'm going to construct the index, and then here's how I'm going to measure things if I own, let's say I only see candy bars. That's the only prices I see in the whole economy. Can I just look at candy bar prices and infer the Phillips curve from that? Or is that way off from what the whole index would be telling me? Or under what conditions would that tell me the right, give me the right signal about the overall index? Because these shares are moving around all the time, and that's a huge part of building a price index. Philippe, and then I will take two last uh, questions. <laughs> so, let me come back to this uh, issue about uh, the role of uh, globalization, because I, I think uh, I would fully agree that elasticity is changing and so on. But the particular historical episode we've been uh, experiencing is maybe not a perfect guide to the future, which is a, a lot of the global impulses have been towards low inflation. So maybe a lot of uh, investment in manufacturing capacity in emerging Asia, uh, maybe not enough domestic spending in those economies for a while. So that essentially there was a kind of a deflationary pressure on say manufacturing prices around the world. But as domestic spending goes up in emerging markets, as these economies switch from investment towards uh, consumption, uh, maybe we'll have the opposite. Maybe there would be actually inflationary pressures uh, coming out of some, some other economies. Uh, equally, uh, Kristen did cross-country regressions, but of course, uh, in, many, in many economies, they're constrained by low inflation overseas. So I'm pretty sure as, the EC, as your area inflation goes up and ECB monetary policy uh, normalizes, the ability of Sweden to meet its inflation target will change. The ability of other uh, smaller economies, equally for the US vis-a-vis -vis, uh, dollar trackers. So there's a synchronization issue here which uh, has been here where we, we've all had low inflation. Uh, that doesn't necessarily follow the f for the future, but what is for sure is that if inflation goes up in other countries, it's going to be easier to uh, meet it at home. And everywhere, even uh, Iceland, uh, the non-traded sector is so important. You know, that uh, a lot of what we consume is local, whether it's rents, uh, uh, hotels, entertainment, whatever, uh, personal services. Uh, in the end, uh, you have to have that domestic uh, activity level hot enough to have significant uh, domestic inflation. Two last questions, James. And then Stefan, Stefan Geller. Uh, Jim Bullard, uh, rec uh, refreshing our recollections about um, these, uh, the problems with these reduced form estimates was, and, the, and the, uh, this good arts law type issue is extremely useful. That's a, a relevant point. The, challenges, where that takes you is going back to thinking about estimation of those structural parameters. And of course, that's a laudable activity, but those open up an entire host of econometric problems, too. And they are basically unidentified. Um, you'll find uh, a lot of evidence of that in, in the literature. So now we find ourselves in a circumstance where those structural parameters that you want to use in the more sophisticated structural models or the DSGEs for monetary policy are essentially just calibrated objects relying on market expectations. They're not going to be able to identify those any better than our excellent staff at the <laughs> banks. So I think we're in a, it opens up a whole host of new, complicated, really, really severe problems. <laughs> That's safe. That's safe. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, and before we leave the room, there will be a second polling question. Okay. Before um, we leave the room. So on this issue of communicating uh, with the markets as opposed to communicating with households, as Charles brought up, it, it, it seems to me that uh, households' inflation expectations are pretty constant. They don't respond to central bank announcements. But markets, uh, they, they do respond. Uh, inflation expectations change, and therefore long bond yields change, and therefore expected long real interest rate change in the current setup. And that sort of strikes 
pretty neat. So I want to hear your views on that. Two comments, so one question and a comment to, to Christine here. First, on, in, if you estimate a Phillips curve for any small open economy, may that be Sweden or Switzerland or Portugal, you would always have some measure of import prices in there. You would always have oil prices in there. So perhaps we're not so far, so far apart. Can I invite you to comment on your confidence bands that you plotted? Because I think that's what a central 30% of the distribution, and it seemed to me that if you used any conventional confidence band, you know, you know 95% confidence band, Zero would always be in the confidence band. Perhaps I was wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe on this, Christine. Yeah. Maybe you answer. Okay. Um, no. Right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right <laughs> okay. Yes. No, I, I plotted some of these. So the graphs I showed were the medians when you do this country by country. And what stands out when you do this is you get very different estimates for different countries. So I just limited it to sort of the medians um, to get sort of the median of the countries. You always have some outliers where global slack doesn't matter, import prices don't matter, oil prices don't matter. And so I was just trying to focus. And that's why I set slightly different bands so the graphs were still readable. Um, but I also, your comment that, of course, when you estimate the uh, Phillips curve, you add in the import prices or oil prices. Um, it is, some countries are much more disciplined by this and do add at least one control for global factors. Um, but what surprises me is it's still only, it's one variable to capture everything going on in the global economy. Supply chains, trade, import prices, oil, exchange rates. Um, but yet, maybe it's partly because I sit in the U.S., it's amazing how many people who work in the US who are leading macroeconomists who study the world still don't include anything about the rest of the world in their models. And I think that's the one message I want to drive home, even if for your US-based well economists. That's well taken. Casey. Yeah, you yeah, need it. Yes, <laughs> uh, Jim? Yeah, on this question of communicating <clears throat> directly to the masses as opposed to communicating mostly with financial markets, I guess my judgment, listening to everybody here, is it's going to be an uphill battle to uh, if you're really trying to uh, communicate to the general public, and that has not historically been uh, how uh, central banks have focused. Uh, we do a lot more outreach than we used to. We do talk to a wide variety of groups. Uh, we do listen to uh, all kinds of people talking about the economy and try to take their concerns on board and try to learn about the economy. But I don't think it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to be a realistic substitute for talking to financial markets. So at least in my head, it, we talk to financial markets. They set the prices. The, the private sector has to take those prices as given when they make decisions. And this is how things, uh, the natural order of things. I don't know if I can write a model down to get that, but that's, that's how I think about things. <laughs> the uh, following question. And then we can go for lunch. Yeah. Pick up your application, your smartphones. What could central banks do to ensure that inflation expectation of firms and households are aligned with the inflation target? Press one if you think that the emphasis on communication should be shifted from financial market participants to firms and households. Press two if you think that improve financial literacy and awareness of monetary policy. Three, for frame communication, including the use of social media, to target specific population subgroups. Four, all of the above. Ah, you yeah, have 15 seconds. Cast your vote. Everybody votes. Here's the research. So all of the above wins. Thank you. Let's, let's go for lunch now. <laughs>